Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends, guys. Welcome back to our slash malicious compliance, where people follow orders to a T to spite someone. And in today's episode, it's all about terrible bosses getting what they deserve, guys. And in this episode, OP takes his boss to court after his boss laughs at him and he makes him regret it big time. Guys, I hope you enjoy the stories. Don't shake your heads too hard. And as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. Let's dive in. So this is my husband's story from a few years ago. My husband was an equipment salesman and he had a company pickup truck that he brought home at night and on weekends. His company did not allow personal use, aside from driving it to and from work. Some salesmen did take advantage of having a pickup truck and they did use it for personal use. So the company installed GPS systems on all company vehicles. My husband was pretty miffed as he really had not misused his truck, but he figured he had nothing to hide so he shrugged it off. In February, he had to attend a trade show on a Saturday. This triggered the GPS and he got a nasty call from his boss. My husband had to provide documentation that he was attending a company sanctioned event. He felt like he was being babysat, and this happened a couple of other times as well. So one Saturday that spring, he backed the truck out of the garage and onto the driveway to get the lawnmower out. After he finished mowing, he pulled it back into the garage, and yep, you guessed it, this triggered the GPS twice. And on Monday, his boss called him into his office and chewed him out. My husband tried to explain, but Lou was mad. He said to my husband, you know you're not allowed to drive the company truck on the weekend. What are you doing? My husband tells the boss, I was moving it out of the garage so I could get my mower out. Does your report show how far each trip was? Boss man says, they were 0.0025 miles each. He then paused as he seemed to realize how short of a distance these trips were. He then said, but that doesn't matter. No driving after hours or on the weekends. Got it? This is being noted in your file. Of course, my husband was pretty mad after that meeting for good reason. So on the weekends, he either parked on the street or in the driveway. A few weeks later, his compliance became malicious. We lived in the Midwest, where thunderstorms, tornadoes, and hailstorms are not uncommon. And on this day, we were under a severe storm advisory with a tornado watch in effect, along with a strong probability of hail. So that's when I asked my husband, should you move your truck into the garage? My husband said, well, you'd think so, but today's a Sunday, and I'm forbidden from driving my truck even a few feet, so it's gonna stay exactly where it is. As the night went on, the winds picked up, and then hail came down, the size of a quarter and bigger. My husband just stood looking out the window at the truck, grinning. On Monday, he came into work, with dents all over the truck. Boss takes one look at the truck, and he loses his mind. My husband loved explaining the damage to his boss and reminded him why the truck was no longer parked in a nice safe garage. He reminded his boss that it was a shame that he wasn't allowed to move the truck inside the garage when he became aware that a storm was coming for the fear of getting chewed out by him again. The boss knew damn well he had maliciously followed the policy, but he couldn't do a thing about it. The policy was relaxed and reworded a few weeks later. Now that was a satisfying malicious compliance, guys. And I love that OP's husband was just standing there watching with a giant smile on his face. Like, I'm just imagining OP's husband standing there, watching the hail pelt the truck, hopefully enjoying a nice warm beverage, and thinking, what a damn shame this is. And guys, the only thing that could have made it better is if the severe storm brought down a tree on top of the truck. Oh, I'm so sorry, boss man. I knew that tree was gonna fall over as soon as the winds picked up, but I didn't want to get yelled at. And while we're on the topic of dumb rules being enforced at work, listen to this next one, guys. So many, many years ago, I worked in a small coffee shop on a university campus. Work was great. We had fun and we loved the owners. Unfortunately, after two years of working there, they retired. That's when the new owner came in and he put up multiple cameras trained at the counter and staff areas. Not only that, the guy used to proposition the girls working there, telling them that they would get extra shifts if they went home with him. If you argued back, you got your work hours cut down to the bare minimum. So a couple of months in, he decides that he's going to change the uniform. Our uniform was just a loose black polo shirt with a cafe logo along with black pants and closed shoes. Standard coffee shop attire. The guy decides that the uniform will change, but only for the girls. Now the girls will have to wear a midriff top with a cafe logo and low-rise pants. 
the boys will still get to wear the old uniform. Of course, we argued that it was unsafe, as hot coffee and plates of food were next to bare skin. And we got told, too bad, so sad, if you work here, you have to obey the dress code. So staff got together and hashed out a plan. The first day of the new uniform, the girl showed up in the old uniform. The boys showed up in the midriff tops and the low-rise pants. The new uniform policy lasted about an hour. The boss was not impressed. You could see him fuming. No one lost their job because our coffee shop was right next to the law faculty. One of the students had already had a conversation with her lecturer about what's going on. I'm pretty sure that if we were fired for non-compliance with uniform, that the boss would have found himself in far more trouble. Well, doesn't that owner sound like a great guy to work for? And I'm glad all the staff members got together to fight against this creep for making up those stupid rules. And with that said, a lot of you will be glad to know that the company closed down after six months due to this idiot taking over. Like, it's amazing how quick bad management can destroy something. From a long-standing mom-and-pop shop to a sleazy owner who managed to destroy the long-standing business in only six months. It's almost like a magic trick, guys. And this person shares their comment about their ridiculous work rule they had to follow. This person says, I first started working at 17 as a housekeeper, cleaning condos in downtown Toronto. It wasn't a bad gig. The building was under construction, so there was quite a bit of dust. But other than that, it was fairly easy work. And at the time, I was getting above minimum wage. I was the only cleaner in that building, but I was good friends with the security guards and would hang out with them on most of my breaks. They were all smokers, and I noticed that they were taking small breaks. So if I happened to be near them when they were taking a smoke break, I would hang out with them. Now, my boss was a sweet guy, but he did make up one stupid rule. He said that the smoke breaks are for smokers only, and I can't just hang out with them. So next break, I had sat down with the security guards and they joked that I should just hold a cigarette in my hand, but not actually smoke it. And that's when I decided to be a little bit more creative with my malicious compliance. The next day, I came into work with a small pack of sparklers. I kept them in my pocket, and when I saw the security guards taking a smoke break, I went out with them and pulled out a sparkler, lit up, and just kind of stood there with them as the sparkler went off. We all had a good chuckle about it. The boss saw me, and he came outside, probably to talk to me about not taking a smoke break if I wasn't a smoker, but he saw the sparkler in my hand. The security guards pointed out that technically I was smoking as the sparkler was producing bits of smoke. The boss, being a good guy, just laughed it off. He apologized. And after that, he said as long as I get my work done, I can take smoke breaks with the others, with or without the sparklers. At least this boss had a good sense of humor, right? And seriously, some bosses really have to take a step back and really think of the rules they're trying to enforce. So this happened 12 to 15 years ago. My ex-boss was a bully. I took the official route and he lost his job in the end for breaking pregnancy laws. Around this time, I kept getting really bad ear infections in my ears. I was told that I could still work. And it's important to note that I became fully deaf and I was wearing two hearing aids. Without them, I hear nothing. So he had me on a freezing snowy day, stand outside, running a stand about environmental work that was due to be carried out. I had a bad ear infection and a cold already. By the end of the day, I couldn't feel my feet. My boss told me it was my fault for not drinking hot drinks. The next day was Saturday, and I spent the day in the warmth of my flat trying to get better. But my ear was killing me. So I called my doctor, and I was told to go to a treatment center. I was seen, and I got told that I had a very nasty ear infection, and he gave me antibiotics. I woke up Sunday to my ear being twice its normal size. It was burning, and half my face was numb, and I knew I was in a bad way. I drove myself to the hospital at 1am, and all they could do at the time was give me pain medication and make me comfortable, until the ear specialist comes in on Monday morning. Several hours go by, and by that time, I can't move my jaw. My ear is swollen shut. My ear was so badly infected that I was admitted with a drip of antibiotics and a morphine pump. Anyhow, after two weeks, I was back at work, in front of my boss and the HR lady, as I had gone over my 10 days sick allowance. I told my boss that I was in the hospital for over a week, and he said it doesn't matter, you should still come into work if you have a bad ear. I said to him I do, but if both ears flare up, I can't come in. The HR lady said that would be fine if we give you office work and phone duties. That's when I said, you want me to come in when I can't wear my hearing aids and do phone duties? Both her and the boss say yes, and I say, okay, 
Fine then. I signed the paperwork to say we had this chat, etc. I was angry, as I felt he had caused me to be in the hospital, and they don't keep you in hospitals for the sake of it. Sure enough, the following month, both ears flare up, and I couldn't wear both hearing aids. It was scary for me to leave my home not being able to hear, but I had to follow their rules. I got into the office, told my boss that both ears had gone bad again, but I'm here. My boss said something to me, and I decided to not lip read as I wasn't making it easy for him. I kept shouting, what did you say? After a few times, he wrote to go to the desk over there and deal with any phone calls, and I shout, okay. So I just sit there, staring at the phone, waiting for it to ring. After a couple of hours, the phone hasn't rung, and the boss came over and started talking to me, all red in the face. I look at him puzzled and said, what did you say? My boss looked so angry, and he wrote down, why aren't you answering the phone? And that's when I looked back at him, and I screamed, well, I haven't heard it rung yet. And I swear, he had steam coming out of his ears. I got sent back home, as I was a health and safety risk. Apparently, the phone had been ringing off the hook the whole time. But of course, I couldn't hear it ringing. Like seriously, asking a deaf person who can't wear their hearing aids to do phone duties. Serves him right. All I can say is Opie handled that wonderfully, guys. And sometimes I really wonder how bosses become bosses in the first place. Like, how can you be mad at someone when they tell you they can't hear without hearing aids and you put them on phone duty? Like, you're telling me at no point did the words, I can't hear anything, and phone duties click together for the dude. Again, I'm just glad Opie handled it the way they did, and I freaking lost it, guys, when the boss was like, the phone's been ringing off the hook, why didn't you answer a single call? Like, I don't know who's worse, guys, HR or the boss in this one. So this started some time back. I got fired from my job due to an injury, and I had to be hospitalized for a significant time. In my contract, it states that if I had more than X amount of sick days in a 12-month period, that I would get my contract terminated with one month notice. So that happened, and of course, I contacted my union. They told me it was a legal termination, but they asked me about a specific part of my contract, which was about my commission. It turns out I've missed out on some special commission during my employment, and I totally missed it when I read my contract when I got employed. My union advised me to contact the boss and show him the part of my contract and proof of the missing commission to try to get a settlement. I was looking for what's equivalent to 3,000 euros. So I went to see my boss and it started with a nice chat. After 10 minutes, I bring up the issue and showed him my contract and showed him that I've never gotten the commission stated in the contract. At that, my boss just laughed and he told me straight up to contact his lawyers if I want to dispute this and that we were done talking and he told me to leave. So cue the malicious compliance. I went home, looked at every paycheck through, and then set up a meeting with the lawyer. We found a lot of small mistakes on my paychecks and summed it all up. We then sent an official letter to his lawyers and we got an answer a few days later. Now he's willing to settle for the first amount, the equivalent to 3,000 euros, and I smiled and laughed. No can do, Mr. Boss Man, not anymore. Now I want the full amount, which is equivalent to 10,000 euros, plus pension, plus 15% in damages, plus all the legal fees. And I have proof of everything to back up my claim. So fast forward to the date of court, and guess what? The guy lost big time. I've now planned a nice vacation, and I still have more money than I asked for in the first place. Excellent malicious compliance, and guys, I love it when people play the lawyer card as a way to intimidate others and end up regretting it big time when they do get taken to court. And if I were OP, I would have looked boss man right in the face and been like, man, thanks for telling me to talk to lawyers. But with that said, I hope OP enjoys that vacation and sends their old boss a postcard, and that he informs all of his past co-workers of what happened and passed on his attorney's contact information. Because you never know. So I got my first grown-up job while I was finishing my bachelor's degree. I was just getting started in a highly technical and emerging field. Very few people back then were doing this kind of work, and I seemed to have an aptitude for it, which is probably why I got a job before I had credentials. 
The department I was hired for was brand new and had the potential to take customers from other departments, while also generating net new business. Interestingly, the other departments had been offered the opportunity to start the service themselves, but refused, even actively trying to prevent it from happening. And that's the reason I ended up in a malicious compliance situation. The leaders of all the other departments conspired to prevent me from getting an office. Now, I didn't understand at first, because at that age, I did not imagine professionals did petty immature things. When I realized what was happening, I knew they'd get exposed if I went along with it. So I happily did my job wherever I could find a place, which often ended up being in the mail room, where lots of people would notice. I hoped that maybe the leaders would start to feel guilty or annoyed and change their minds, or they would be caught by their bosses. Either way, the problem solved for me without a fight. Little did I know how well it would go. I started to be well liked by a lot of the leaders because I helped them with their computers. There was this one leader though who still hated me. I never spoke with him, not even one word, but he continued to insist that I did not need an office. To him, I wasn't even the level of a secretary, which I took to be a dig at my lack of a degree. I heard him saying that from a friend who was in the meeting when they talked about changing their minds. Now it's too bad for them that they didn't change their minds because the president came through the mailroom multiple times and finally stopped clearly annoyed and said, why don't you work in your office? And that was my golden moment. I had complied politely with not having an office and I sweetly told the president, uh, I don't have an office. The president says, what? Why not? That's when I say, there isn't room, there's no space available. The president says, according to whom? I tell them, Mr. So-and-so. President then says, but you've been working here for what, three months? They could have found a space for you by now. The president was beat red at that point. I just smiled and said, my understanding is, there is no space. The president literally stomped upstairs to the offices of Mr. So-and-so. I then distinctly heard yelling from downstairs, and people outside probably heard it. The president then came in and brought me upstairs to the conference room where the leaders were all seated, looking down. There was a pile of keys on the table and I was afraid at that point. Was she having me pick someone's office to take? And while that might have been a sweet revenge, it wouldn't have been good for my working relationships with any of them. But no, she then hands me a key to the conference room and said, this is now your office. She then scoops up the rest of the keys, which I learned later were all their copies of the key to the conference room. And then she said, your office is the largest one on campus, even bigger than mine. Enjoy. And then she walked out. And that was probably the best drop the mic moment that I've ever seen in my life. And the story ends with my compliance not only winning me that office, but all the other leaders except Mr. So-and-so becoming great colleagues. But it's not over. One sunny day, six months later, Mr. So-and-so passes me on the stairs outside the building. I was leaving, and I said good morning to him. We were the only two people, or so I thought. I wouldn't pass by a coworker like that without a polite greeting. So I was in my office, quietly analyzing some data about an hour later, when once again, a furiously red-faced president storms into my office. I swear, she was 12 feet tall in her anger. She then demanded, what's going on between you and Mr. So-and-so? At that, my heart was racing at probably 150 beats per minute because I couldn't comprehend her question. I say to her, what do you mean, what's going on? I have no idea what you're talking about. I then start to imagine that she's accusing me of having a relationship with that man. And I'm thinking, ew. She then said that she wanted to know why he just said what he said about me. And I was flummoxed. I said, uh, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have never said more than a greeting, let alone had a conversation with Mr. So-and-so. I can't think of anything whatsoever that he would have to say about me. She then told me that my sibling had burst into her office, raging about Mr. So-and-so. It turns out, when I walked by him and continued on, the next person he encountered was my sibling, but he didn't know that. We both worked for the same company, but I was married and we had different last names. If he bothered to get to know me at all, he would have known that. He then walked right up to my sibling and he said, there goes a bitch with her head up her ass. He assumed that everyone else hated me too. He barely knew my brother, but he felt comfortable saying that. So my brother walks right into the president's office, interrupting a meeting, and repeated what Mr. So-and-so said. The president assumed I was aware, but my brother hadn't gotten to me yet. And I didn't realize how much Mr. So-and-so hated me. I told the president that I genuinely didn't believe it was really about me. It couldn't be because we've never spoken to each other. 
that it had to be about what I represented, which was a major change to the organization. She then walked into his office, then more yelling ensued, followed by her screaming, if you can't play nice, pack up your things and leave. Pretty soon, they were back in my office, and he apologized, and I repeated what I told the president, that I didn't believe it was really about me, and Mr. So-and-so agreed. Later on, I had a project with him, and he started to trust me. We ended up being able to work together with no further issues. Now that president is freaking awesome, guys. Like, it must feel so incredible having the big boss take your side when a superior is straight up bullying you. And I only wish OP's final words after the president dragged Mr. So-and-so to her office and made him apologize were, Thank you. Now get out of my office. That would have been incredible. I was telling a friend this story, and he told me to post it here. So in high school, I worked as a certified nurse's assistant at a local nursing home. I only worked there on the weekend because my parents wanted me to focus on school during the week. Now anyone in the health field knows that you cannot work with the elderly when you're sick, because some elderly people can die from the common cold. So when I was 17, I got really, really sick. I got sick on a Tuesday with a light cough, and by Friday, I felt like I was going into a 10-minute coughing fit. The next Monday was Labor Day, and my regular doctor was closed all weekend. My parents decided that we couldn't wait until Tuesday, and we went to the ER. I had a bad case of bacterial pneumonia. Now for those who don't know, regular pneumonia usually results from a bad case of a flu or another illness. It's extremely contagious. I was admitted to the hospital, and I was hooked up to tubes, and it turns out I was also dehydrated from being so sick. Around midnight, I realized that I needed to call in, since I won't be able to work the next three days. So I called the nurse's desk and told the RN on duty that I've been diagnosed with pneumonia, and won't be able to work this weekend due to the possibility that I'll still be contagious. She then tells me, if you wanted a three-day weekend, you should not have volunteered to work. You can't fake a cough to get out of work in the real world, sweetheart. And then she hung up. I then asked my dad what I should do, and he took the phone and took a picture of me in the hospital bed. And then we got a signed note from the doctor and took a picture of that. He then told me to email those to the director of nursing for the facility. I did that, and I also told her what the RN told me. The thing is, at this facility, any calls through the nurse's station are recorded to protect the facility from lawsuits and to protect the residents from negligent caretakers. She was on record, telling me what she did. When I returned two weeks later, I learned that she had been suspended for eight weeks without pay for negligence. In my opinion, suspended for eight weeks without pay is not enough, guys. Like, I honestly expected better from an RN that's working in a nursing home. And it sounds to me like OP actually worked at a decent nursing home that cared about their residents. And this person says she should have been fired, perhaps even had her certification removed. If that's her attitude towards anybody who's sick, regardless of the circumstances, then how would she act if a resident said they were sick? That woman's a danger to herself, her co-workers, and her charges. Let me know if you agree or disagree. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, subscribe so you don't miss these crazy stories. And if you missed yesterday's episode on the channel, it's in our slash entitled People episode where a psycho Karen won't let paramedics save her dying dad. It's such a crazy story. So go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.